Sure. Thank you everybody for coming to today's internal medicine grand rounds. It is um, very exciting for me to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Carrie Holmes Maybach, a um, colleague of mine for many, many years. Um, I've had the chance to see her speak and I think we're all in, in, um, in, in luck and gonna get something special today. So just uh, so you all know, Dr. Holmes Maybach is an associate professor in the Division of Hospital Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. She also obtained her MD and completed her residency in internal medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. She's board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. She's an academic hospitalist with interests in addiction medicine and pain, and she's actively involved with medical student education, leading a number of courses at the Medical University of South Carolina. I happen to have known Dr. Holmes Maybach for many years through our uh, mutual work at the Society of General Internal Medicine, where for the last two years, she has been the one of the presenters for the update in hospital medicine. And she's presented a lot of other stuff there. She led the academic hospitalists. I want to say, was it still task force when you were in charge or have we? We actually got to make the transition thanks to your hard yeah. work in previous years. Yeah, so uh, it is was a task force elevated to the level of commission, which is a big organizational step up, I guess. And um, she was fantastic at leading that uh, task force slash commission for several years. We got a lot done under her leadership. Um, she's a real force in hospital medicine. And so I'd like you all to give her a big warm Beth Israel welcome. And uh, I think we're all really excited for this talk. Great. Well, great. And Alfred, um, I, ho I hope that I, I do you right and make you proud. Um, oh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be presenting to you all again. Um, knowing Dr. Berger certainly elevates Mount Sinai even higher to me. Um, today, we're going to talk about substance use disorders and hospitalized patients. I'm going to be presenting mostly what are actually more recommendations um, than really being able to say hard and fast rules that are based on the available clinical research that we have, as well as professional society recommendations. I will say, please bear with me, I just read a report that South Carolinians are the second slowest talkers in the United States. And of course, I have a bit of a cold, so I'm gonna do my best to keep a good pace for you all. Um, okay, Manira, let's see, okay, there it goes. All right, um, for, for better or worse, I have no disclosures to make. And also um, this lecture does include off-label uh, uses of medication. Um, our learning objectives, I cut these kind of broad. Alrighty, um, so I'm gonna be honest with you, just starting off the bat here, this is not great data, but I just wanted to show you what I was able to find, um, which is the prevalence of substance use disorders in hospitalized patients. Um, as you can imagine, this is really difficult to um, really get a good uh, uh, overview of or, or do kind of a, a research study with because it's all based on coding. And frankly, I don't know that I do a good job of coding my individual, for example, that has tobacco use disorder, um, probably even sometimes with stimulant use disorder. But this is what I was able to find. And it does show you that when we look at our hospitalized patients, they do have a higher prevalence than the general public. And experts do agree, and I'm sure all of you would agree, that we certainly agree with that, that it is higher than in the general population. What's especially troubling is there are good studies that do look at particular problems such as opioid use disorder and whether or not we're seeing more hospitalizations associated with that. Same thing for cannabis, stimulants, alcohol, et cetera. And sadly, over approximately the past 10 years, we have seen um, some of these substances saw a little bit of a dip, but we are starting to see it go back up again. And that was even um, a trajectory that was occurring prior to COVID. So something that's really important for all of us to consider. Um, thinking about what we have to deal with the most in our hospitalized patients, I am going to focus on withdrawal syndromes. Um, and these quite oftentimes are more challenging for us to treat. So um, I am going to start off with alcohol withdrawal, which I'm, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with because it is the most commonly seen withdrawal in the hospitalized patients. 
and can be fatal. So um, kind of starting off with how to approach those patients is seeing who probably has alcohol use disorder to know who's gonna be at risk, um, particularly for those that kind of unclear when they're coming in the door or perhaps it's somebody on um, a consult service and they're about to have surgery and you're thinking about what are the risks gonna be for this individual going into withdrawal. So here's the classic CAGE questionnaire, the four questions that you all I'm sure are familiar with. It has been used in hospitalized patients to detect uh, alcohol use disorder, but it does have some downsides. It can't really determine well between current and previous, and it also doesn't pick up on risky drinking and it's not proven across cultural groups. So we've really tried to move away from that and move on to the alcohol use disorders identification test. Um, that's a 10 item screener. And then there's what we call the audit C, which as you can see is a three item screener. So both of these, um, they were developed by the World Health Organization. Um, they are, are more, uh, sorry, they're culturally sensitive, widely applicable. And this is what is more frequently used among addictionologists and also in research. This will identify your current alcohol use and at-risk drinking, which we do know um, patients that are at-risk drinkers can go into withdrawal. And you can see it's got a good specificity for both um, alcohol use disorder and heavy drinking. This is the alcohol use disorders identification test, Piccinelli or um, audit PC. This was specifically developed for detecting a patient's risk of going into alcohol withdrawal seizures. So this is really applicable, applicable for our patients, particularly if we have concerns about alcohol. Um, it specifically was um, developed also for medically ill patients. And as you guys can see, for actually determining withdrawal, it's got good sensitivity and specificity. And for being able to predict complicated withdrawal, it's even higher. Um, the next is the prediction of alcohol withdrawal safety scale or PALS. As you can see, it's a bit longer. It's 10 questions, again, specifically for uh, determining whether or not a patient's at risk for going into alcohol withdrawal while in the hospitalized setting, but it's actually easier to grade. So um, a lot of pay, uh, providers prefer to use this and a score of greater than four has great sensitivity and specificity. There are other um, scales that are out there, but um, I feel like these are probably the ones that apply best to the patients we're talking about, which is more our, our patients that are on the general medicine wards and, and also on the surgical wards. Other screeners that we need to think about when it comes to all of our substances are getting that collateral from family, friends, roommates, whoever they spend some time with. Um, either because the patient's not able to give us the information or if we kind of have that gut feeling that we're concerned about some other things. Chart review can potentially be very revealing. Um, obviously, we want to get a blood alcohol level. We want to check the prescription drug monitoring program and we want to check a uh, urine drug test. Now, of course, we all know uh, urine drug tests only test for what it tests for. There are a lot of substances that are not currently um, able to be tested for. That might be where we get some help from our family, friends, et cetera. Um, so be aware of the limitations of those tests. But these should really probably be checked on every patient that's using any, time of, any kind of substance, um, not only to determine what substance they're using, but also if they're in for something such as um, opioid withdrawal, we want to find out if they have been abusing benzodiazepines as well, which may complicate our treatment for their withdrawal. Um, specifically for uh, alcohol, it is recommended um, expert opinion to check hepatic function and GGT by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, I have seen some literature that recommends checking PEP, um, but that's not actually in the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine guidelines right now. But it is something to consider because it, um, it does correlate with the amount of alcohol used and takes about 28 days for it to resolve. And then this gets us to outside of alcohol, um, a screener. This is the one question drug screener that was developed by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It has been um, uh, tested against other longer screeners such as the drug abuse screening test or DAST that you may be um, uh, familiar with. And so this has uh, great sensitivity, not as great specificity. Um, how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? Um, one caveat I will say with this is because cannabis um, is legal in some areas, I think you need to go ahead and specifically ask about that as well. 
And once you've asked this question, you can also uh, become more specific about particular um, substances. Alrighty, um, so uh, this, this is an FYI slide, just reminding you that alcohol withdrawal is a diagnosable syndrome based on the DSM-5, and that um, what we're looking for is that these are criteria are occurring with a significant reduction in use or complete cessation of that alcohol use. It can't be attributed to another substance or another process that's going on. Um, the first, all right, um, the first big um, issue that we concern, get, get concerned about is alcohol withdrawal seizures. There tends to be a timeline, um, but not every patient follows the, the sequence of events correctly. So usually you've already started with some minor withdrawal symptoms and that start around six hours, and then we get into the alcohol withdrawal seizures. On average, it's about 12 to 48 hours after decreasing or cessation of alcohol. Um, could start as early as eight hours, has a peak around 24 hours, and then around 48 hours. For the most part, the literature says you can feel pretty comfortable um, assuming they're out of the window. The chance of having an alcohol withdrawal seizure greatly increases with the years of consistent drinking, um, also with kindling. So for those of you that um, need a reminder, kindling is the process that um, the brain has changes that occur with each subsequent withdrawal. So each withdrawal puts that patient at risk for alcohol withdrawal seizures, or greater risk for alcohol withdrawal seizures, also alcohol withdrawal delirium, um, and also tends to make each subsequent withdrawal more severe. Additional indicators that have been found in the literature are a patient that's got tremors, hypertension, overactive reflexes, fever, and tachycardia. An important thing to think about with the alcohol withdrawal seizures is if you have a patient that has experienced one, is they have um, a greater chance of having a subsequent one during that hospitalization. So um, they're also more at risk for developing that alcohol withdrawal delirium. So we wanna make sure we treat that aggressively and monitor them for at least 24 hours. Um, alcohol withdrawal delirium, that is the correct term for what we used to call the DTs or delirium tremens. Um, this can be um, one of, uh, also can be fatal. It's considered the most intense or one of the most intense syndromes. Um, some of the literature says the most intense syndromes by patients. It can start, it's usually about 72 to 96 hours. It could be as early as 48 hours. It tends to last about two to three days. But again, as usual, um, we've got variation among patients. Some are lucky enough to have it just last a few hours. Some that could be as, as long as five days pretty easily. The um, old data, showed that you could potentially have um, a percentage of fatality with it as much as 15%. The very exciting news is that now it's estimated to be less than 1% of deaths secondary to alcohol withdrawal delirium. And that is 100% because we are identifying alcohol withdrawal earlier and we are treating it more aggressively. So this is all your hard work has really decreased the mortality rate for alcohol withdrawal delirium. When we look at risk factors for alcohol withdrawal delirium, um, history of sustained large amounts of alcohol, they've had alcohol withdrawal delirium before, greater than 30 years old. Honestly, that probably is just someone who has been drinking since an early age, so they've just gotten that sustained um, large amounts of alcohol. They've got another illness that may be serious, medical or psychiatric, significant withdrawal symptoms with an elevated blood alcohol level, and then of course, prolonged interval between cessation and presentation. So they've not had any type of treatment to keep them from going into the alcohol withdrawal delirium. Um, when we look at who should be admitted for treatment and also who is at risk of severe withdrawal, because that's who we wanna capture. We want to um, have inpatient treatment for the patient who is at risk for going through severe or complicated withdrawal, there's really no established guideline out there. However, very consistently in the literature, severe alcohol withdrawal symptoms, a history of alcohol withdrawal seizures, alcohol as history of the alcohol withdrawal delirium and a history of kindling, pretty much universally in everything I've read, they recommend that you have that patient admitted for um, withdrawal treatment or, or detox. 
Um, other things that have been found in the literature is, of course, the long duration and high levels of alcohol use, use of a concomitant medication that can complicate the withdrawal, particularly benzodiazepines or barbiturates. I would say unquestionably that person needs to be inpatient. If you've got the elevated BAL or blood alcohol level with um, withdrawal seizures, um, also hot, autonomic hyperactivity. There are different CEWA scores that have been recommended. Greater than 19 is pretty universally accepted as severe withdrawal. 10 to 18, um, you really wanna think about it, particularly if patients have other concerning risk factors. Um, and of course, pregnancy. And you guys, I'm sure are very familiar with this, our old friend, the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment Scale. Uh, this one is specifically for alcohol or CWA or AR, the revised version that we're all using. Um, it has well-documented reliability, reproducibility, and validity. It's helpful to us for many reasons. It can help us choose a site for detox because it lets us know what the severity is. Um, it can be used for symptom triggered therapy and it can also evaluate the progress of our patients as we're treating them. Um, and higher scores have been associated with alcohol withdrawal seizures and alcohol withdrawal delirium. So very helpful scale. Quick reminder, 12 items that you go through. Um, However, when we've got our patients that are severely altered or delirious, sometimes they're unable to do the self-reporting that is necessary for the CWA scale. And that's, that's where it gets a little challenging. Um, the only scales that are recommended at this time are the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or RAS and the Confusion Assessment Method for ICU. But again, both of these are gonna be used in the ICU setting as opposed to really being something we're using on the floor. The other thing to keep in mind with these is they're not specific for alcohol withdrawal, and so you cannot use them for symptom triggered. You can, of course, use them, though, to assess the patient's delirium, and that may help you make a decision as to whether or not you feel like you need to make adjustments. There is a scale that I'm hoping we're going to see in the future, the Brief Alcohol Withdrawal Scale, or BOS. Um, that has been studied at Johns Hopkins, both on patients on the medical wards as well as in the ICU. It's only five items. The patient does not have to be self-reporting. So hopefully we'll see this in the future and that may help us with our patients uh, that are unable to talk. And it also may be an easier scale for us to use um, than the CEWA. So not ready for prime time, but hopefully we'll be hearing about that soon. Alrighty, so pharmacologic management. Um, no question whatsoever that sedative hypnotics are first line and they have the best um, uh, data out there, the best evidence. Everything I have been able to find recommends benzodiazepines as first line. I've not really been able to find anything that recommends something else. Um, so these are considered first line. They have great um, studies that have shown that they decrease the chance of not slock alcohol or whatever I've tried to uh, spell there, alcohol withdrawal seizures and alcohol withdrawal delirium, and it also decreases the severity of withdrawal symptoms. Uh, when looking at the literature and the American Society of Addiction Medicine just came out with guidelines specifically for alcohol withdrawal in 2020, they really recommend considering a long-acting benzodiazepine. Um, the reason for this being it's got the longer half-life, it can lead to a smoother uh, withdrawal for the patient and um, hopefully less breakthrough symptoms. Um, of course, we have to be careful with benzodiazepines in any patient that has hepatic disease and also in patients such as the elderly, but even more cautious when we have individuals um, that we're considering long acting. Now this is, um, and Minera actually sent me your protocol, and I've talked a lot with our pharmacists about this, is the idea of symptom triggered versus scheduled benzodiazepine. The literature strongly recommends symptom triggered um, only. And the data that has been collected for that showed that it decreased lengths of stay, decreased sedation and decreased benzo use, which of course one would think would end up um, having the shorter lengths of stay. The problem is, is a lot of those patients, when I looked at the data, it really doesn't apply to the patients that I see on the inpatient wards. Um, it's it, the patients that we see are quite oftentimes the patients that we do need to consider scheduling a long acting benzodiazepine, as opposed to making them have to start having more symptoms and be symptom triggered. 
One thing that also concerns me about doing that in the patient population, at least that I see, and I would presume ours are pretty similar, is that if we're not covering them well enough, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak, once they have a seizure. So we really wanna prevent all of that from happening. So I would actually advocate, and in talking to our pharmacists, many that have been at different institutions, they would also advocate for the patients that we see on the wards in general, they're gonna need a scheduled long-acting benzodiazepine and use a short-acting for symptom triggers. Um, again, looking at your, um, your algorithm, it looks like that is not consistent with it, that yours is more consistent with um, saying symptom triggered only. I'll be interested to hear what you guys actually do in practice. The other um, thing, and again, I, I talked with our pharmacist about this, is using diazepam for symptom triggered. Um, it may be a lack of experience on my part and maybe a little bit of a, a control thing, but I really am hesitant to be giving something that's long acting that can have, um, depending on the patient, particularly if they have any hint of underlying hepatic disease, giving them a medication that's going to be long acting and take that chance of it stacking. So again, I just like to schedule it. Um, that's personal preference. And in general, actually, what we do here at our institution. When it comes to who we should think about that for, um, the patients that we really know probably need that scheduled long acting or patients that have a history of alcohol withdrawal seizures, a history of the alcohol withdrawal delirium, and a history of kindling. Also, if they're chronically using benzos or barbiturates that may, may also be withdrawing from, if they've got a really high CWA scale, even though they've still got a high positive um, blood alcohol level, Another group that some of the literature recommends this in is individuals with coronary artery disease or significant cardiovascular disease, because we don't want them having these huge autonomic surges. Um, long duration and high levels of Alka-Sol, uh, definitely somebody to think about that. Again, the autonomic hyperactivity and the higher CWA scales. Going to be honest with you here, when you look at recommendations for certain CWA scores, it's really vari variable across, across the literature. Um, so I really don't feel like I've got a great concrete uh, number to give you for the CWA score. All righty, so um, gabapentin. Gabapentin can be used off-label as an adjunctive medication for benzodiazepines with the hope that it's going to be benzodiazepine sparing. I'm gonna go ahead and just be upfront with you guys. Um, I grew up, so to speak, using gabapentin as an adjunctive. Um, some of the psychiatrists here at my institution did the early trials looking at using gabapentin with alcohol withdrawal. And um, so I have always done it. It's always recommended by our psychiatry consult team. Also, um, even though the, the trials that have been done are conflicting. One trial shows that it may help. The next one is equivocal or doesn't show any improvement at all. Um, it is highly recommended at the meetings. And interestingly, even though, for example, the American Society of Addiction Medicine does not recommend it highly, um, the speakers at their meetings are saying, we recommend that you use gabapentin as an adjunctive. So, um, Based on my personal practice, I will tell you I would do that. Um, it tends to have less drug interactions. It's renally excreted, so it can be very helpful. It's also used in alcohol uh, use disorder. Again, not labeled for that, um, but ha there is some evidence to support it there. Um, some of the problems with these studies, though, is that they were using different doses. Um, they were doing quick titrations down, et cetera. So there was really no standardization across the trials. But in general, it looks like about 1800 milligrams a day divided in either um, three times a day or four times a day is probably what works best. I will tell you at our institution, we tend to use 1200 instead. But, um, and, and my experience has been that I think it is helpful, but 1800 look a day, it looks like it's really what's been described in the literature. Also, what I like is because it is recommended as an off-label for alcohol use disorder, it's been shown to reduce heavy um, drinking, increase abstinence, improve sleep, and help reduce a, a protracted withdrawal syndrome. It's something that I can send my patient out on. And so what I will do is I will do a really long taper, usually over a month. And if that patient is interested in getting engaged in treatment, 
and we can find someone to work with them, it's going to hopefully just be a bridge so they can start that treatment and perhaps the gabapentin will be continued. If not, um, my hope would be that by at least giving them the medication and if they take it for that full month, hopefully it's helping them stay in recovery because some of those symptoms are being better treated um, at least for that time period and hopefully give them a leg up on um, kind of a, a working with AA or something of that nature if they're not going to have pharmacologic help. The next medication that I actually used to just do as an FYI slide to let you know that it may be coming soon is carbamazepine. Um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine just recently changed from just an FYI to saying they recommend that you consider using this. Again, you would use it with a benzodiazepine um, to be benzodiazepine sparing. It has been used in Europe for some time and animal studies show that it may prevent alcohol withdrawal seizures. So great idea to consider. Um, you do have to be careful with hepatic disease and drug interactions. Um, next is clonidine, which again, another change. I used to be very hesitant to recommend this, but the literature is recommending it more. Um, first and foremost, you absolutely have to be using it with a benzodiazepine, 100%, because it can mask your autonomic symptoms. Um, it does nothing to prevent withdrawal seizures or prevent alcohol withdrawal delirium, and uh, again, can mask other symptoms, but if you have a patient that you feel like is on an appropriate dose of benzodiazepine, they're doing well in every way except for these uncontrolled autonomic symptoms, absolutely using clonidine can be helpful in that case to try and control that part of their withdrawal. Or also sometimes they just simply have hypertension and it's been untreated. In that case, you might wanna think about something besides clonidine. Alrighty. So phenobarbital, uh, this is what I have spent um, <laughs> an amazing amount of time working on, um, working with my pharmacists as well as talking to colleagues here and at other institutions. Um, but just a quick history on phenobarbital, it was previously used regularly in alcohol detoxification before benzodiazepines became available. Once benzodiazepines were available, it was felt that they were safer um, a safer alternative because they cause less sedation, respiratory depression, um, were safer to use in hepatic disease and had less drug interactions. So culturally, we really shifted. Um, recently, there has been a big increase in the use of phenobarbital in the emergency department for alcohol withdrawal and subsequently a great deal of discussion about using phenobarbital in med surge patients. I, I get this question every year um, and do a deep dive every year into the literature to see if I can really come up with a good answer for you. The answer is I don't have an answer. The studies are simply not great. They're not great in the ED, they're not great in the ICU, and that's really where the studies have been performed. They tend to be small, they tend to be retrospective, at least for how I treat the patients on the wards, um, it's not really comparable because quite oftentimes it's either uh, just placebo or only symptom triggered benzodiazepines that phenobarbital is being compared to. And there's a great deal of selection bias because these are individuals um, that are being looked at through a retrospective chart review. So nothing that's really a slam dunk um, for using it. And when it comes to med surge studies, very, very little is out there. Um, another piece that becomes really challenging is that groups such as the American Society of Addiction Medicine, if you read the 2020 guidelines, they just over and over again say you have to have experience with phenobarbital. The patient has to be monitored closely. It even says try to avoid IV. So for me, if I'm reading that and I don't have a level of comfort with phenobarbital, that's going to make me hesitant to use it. In talking again with uh, colleagues here, as well as peers at other institutions, a lot of the reason that we've not even been thinking much about it is we don't have that comfort and experience with it, but also we kind of feel like what we're doing is working. Um, so I think that's a lot of the barriers to using it. However, I will tell you over and over again, phenobarbital is recommended for individuals who have benzodiazepine resistant alcohol withdrawal and refractory alcohol withdrawal. Interestingly, though, those are probably your patients that are going to end up in the ICU. Um, when you think about phenobarbital, though, um, particularly in emergency department patients, it's a great drug to consider um, when you have patients, especially that are showing mild symptoms of withdrawal or moderate, and they don't have the risk factors for going on to severe withdrawal. 
this is a perfect population because reports of the half-life are anywhere from 53 hours to 150 something hours. So a lot of the data reports about 100 hours for the half-life. It's got this long duration of action. So you can load the patient there and then um, uh, discharge them, hopefully with a plan to receive some, some um, outpatient follow-up, but very, very helpful when we just don't have um, great programs or just don't have enough beds to help with these folks. And again, they're not somebody that we need to put in the hospital. And in talking to one of my um, ED colleagues last night, he said that's really where the shift has come. He feels like culturally when he goes to the meetings, why people are using phenobarbital more in the, the ER. There is no universal protocol out there kind of similarly to um, the benzodiazepines. But um, this is what I have been able to find in the literature, and this is what, um, in talking with my um, different pharmacy colleagues and um, friends in the emergency room and ICUs, uh, 10 milligrams a kilogram loading dose can be used, either PO, IV, or IM. I'll tell you, um, everybody that I've talked to that's using the phenobarbital, either in the ER or in the um, ICU, is very comfortable using IV, as are all the pharmacists I talk to. Um, and this can be divided into three doses. Of, uh, if you don't want to give 10 right away, it can be four mix, three kicks, three kick, mix a kick um, every two hours. Another protocol that I've seen quite oftentimes is 260 milligrams given one time as a loading dose, and then followed by either 65 milligrams or 130 milligrams um, for symptom triggered. So um, again, uh, nothing that's 100%, this is the one you have to use, but this is what I was able to find the most evidence for. Um, one challenge is that when we do have patients who have required prolonged treatment with phenobarbital, there are really no recommendations about how to do that taper. Um, so we quite oftentimes will have patients that have had refractory alcohol withdrawal, they've been on phenobarbital in the ICU, and then they come out to us. So what do you do? Um, do you do a taper? Do you not do a taper? Honestly, if you're looking at the half-life of phenobarbital, it's probably okay to not do a taper if the patient is out of the window for alcohol withdrawal seizures and they also are not requiring any type of symptom triggered. Um, but again, even at my own institution, talking to different pharmacists, uh, there's disagreement. Some of them feel like we definitely need to do a taper. Others feel like no problem because of the half-life, just go ahead and stop it if they've been receiving doses of phenobarbital over days. So what to do with our med surge patient? The answer is I don't have a <laughs> direct answer. I will tell you that I personally um, will definitely think about using phenobarbital on my challenging alcohol withdrawal patients. Absolutely. Um, I think the more I've been diving into this and talking to my pharmacist, I'm much more comfortable with the prospect of using it. Um, so absolutely should be something to consider. Uh, ICU transfers on phenobarbital, just like we talked about, um, if they get transferred out to you, they're doing well, no um, potential for alcohol withdrawal seizures. You can probably just DC that phenobarbital and put them on a symptom triggered short acting to make sure that um, they don't have anything kind of brewing. Um, if they end up having symptoms, then you're going to need to de decide, do you go back to continuing uh, phenobarbital or do you switch them over to the long-acting benzo? And really, this would be the same thing with individuals that were in the emergency department and received a phenobarb load. load um, probably okay to start off with symptom triggered because that, of that prolonged half-life of the phenobarbital and just do a short-acting um, symptom triggered. If they're triggering it a lot, though, then you're gonna to need to decide, am I gonna use more phenobarbital or am I gonna use long-acting benzo? Um, but bottom line, unquestionably, um, through everything I've read, phenobarbital is a good alternative agent. Um, another thing I just wanna quickly bring up is in talking to um, my pharmacist about the fact that there's all um, a lot of concern about using it because of the narrow therapeutic window, the extended half-life, et cetera. Um, as well as concerns for toxicity um, and talking with, and also drug interactions and talking with them, they said that really the studies that were done um, that show that you need to worry about respiratory depression, for example, those tended to be doses of 20 mg a kg, so much higher than what we're talking about using. Also, those patients tended to be using a concomitant medication that could uh, potentiate respiratory depression. 
I'll say when it comes to drug interactions um, and talking with my pharmacist, they said that really becomes more of a problem when a patient is on chronic phenobarbital. And the doses that are used for seizures are actually higher than a lot of the doses that we're talking about here. Of course, depending on the size of the patient. If the patient um, does have a high um, uh, weight, you're gonna be using higher doses, but still not the 20 mg a kick. So that's a bit reassuring. However, this is kind of exciting. There is a trial that is being done. Um, there's a feasibility pilot that's being done right now in Canada, the phenomenal trial. And um, it's gonna be prospective randomized controlled trial that's gonna look at phenobarbital load with using uh, symptom triggered benzodiazepines compared to benzodiazepines alone. This is gonna look at patients in the ER, patients on the wards and patients in the ICU. So really hoping that this trial goes forward and that it ends up being um, a full-blown trial to hopefully answer some of our questions. All righty. So um, going to the intensive care unit quickly, um, as we mentioned, this is a time when you may be using the phenobarbital and even having to, um, to dose phenobarbital a little more regularly. But some other alternatives are dexmedetomidate, sorry, I always have difficulty saying this particular word, <laughs> dexmatomidine. Um, and it has to absolutely 100% be used with a benzodiazepine in someone that's experiencing alcohol withdrawal, but um, it does tend to have more light sedation without the respiratory depression. And it has been found in studies to decrease delirium severity, decrease the amount of benzodiazepine that's used, and questionably, it may even decrease the need for a vent. Um, so definitely something to think about. Um, I was just talking to our pharmacist and there's actually, um, they're in the process of approving a, an oral form formulation. Um, so it'll be interesting to see many years down the road um, how that is used. Uh, propofol, in theory, it should be able to be used without benzodiazepines but uh, studies have shown it in which it's been used with benzos and it decreased the amount of benzos, but really there were no um, proven benefits with it. I thought I would mention it. A couple of pearls. If you do need to use an antipsychotic, use it spirit, sparingly. And then the ones we would recommend would be risperidone, quetiapine, and haloperidol. For benzodiazepines, if possible, avoid IM. There's just variable absorption with it, um, also variable tapering. So really not um, a great route for giving it if you're going to be using additional benzodiazepines. And um, for your patients that are on scheduled benzodiazepines, do not taper that until you see that the patient is not um, triggering the symptom triggered very often and that CELA score is going down. A last thing to consider is if you have a patient and you feel like they're experiencing delirium, um, possibly even alcohol withdrawal delirium, when you get past that 72 hour point, start considering some other things that may be going on, such as a drug induced delirium or withdrawal from another GABA drug. Also, if they're receiving thousands of milligrams of benzodiazepines, you definitely need to consider benzodiazepine delirium in that case. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about our sedative hypnotics. As a reminder, um, there are DSM-5 diagnosable criteria. Um, when we have a patient that's coming in with a sedative hypnotic withdrawal, we still want to do that full collateral um, screening for other medications, screening for alcohol, looking at the PDMP. Um, and making sure we're doing that. We're gonna focus on benzodiazepine withdrawal today because it's the most commonly seen sedative hypnotic withdrawal. Um, I'm gonna just skip over this, honestly. Um, practice was much faster than actually talking to you all, but the bottom line is just recognize that sometimes there are other discontinuation um, syndromes that the patient could be going through and it's not true withdrawal. However, um, for the patients that um, are going through withdrawal, the likelihood of withdrawal is based on the benzodiazepine dose, the duration of action of that benzodiazepine, and the duration of use. Um, in general, high-dose benzodiazepines, which are considered to be two to three times the therapeutic dose that have been taken regularly for two to three months, or low-dose, which is considered um, therapeutic dose that have been taken daily for four to six months, those are the people we are definitely going to be worried about going through withdrawal is even if they've been taking it for that short a period of time. When we look at withdrawal onset peak um, and duration, it's really, again, gonna depend on what they've been taking. If they've been taking a short acting, it's probably gonna happen in about 24 hours. The peak could be anywhere from one to five days and it could last as long as 21 days. 
For long acting, it could take as long as five days before we see the withdrawal start. The peak could be as long as nine days from them and the duration can be weeks um, up to a month. Um, keep in mind that a higher dose and longer use does increase the severity of withdrawal with um, individuals that have been using benzodiazepine for 12 months, having anywhere from 20 to 80% of them are gonna experience moderate to severe withdrawal. And also um, the chances of experiencing a severe withdrawal with benzodiazepines increases with that same phenomenon of kindling. So your patient has gone through multiple benzo withdrawals, it's made changes in the brain, which is gonna make the other withdrawals more severe. Another thing to be very aware of is higher potency benzodiazepines lead to more rapid tolerance and more severe withdrawal. So alprazolam is the big culprit with this one. And frankly, I just dread dealing with alprazolam um, uh, withdrawals because it's, it's a beast to taper. Um, when we look at treatment for benzodiazepine withdrawal, for treating in the inpatient setting, there are rapid tapers that are out there, but honestly, it's just very risky. Benzo withdrawal is much more dangerous um, than alcohol withdrawal. It has a lot more autonomic um, changes. And also it's been shown that these individuals that get tapered off, they can have an alcohol withdrawal seizure up to several days after the taper has been completed appropriately. So I'm really, really hesitant to do a rapid taper. If you are in a situation where you have to do a rapid taper, again, there are a number that are in the literature, but I would encourage you to try and get an addiction specialist involved for that or someone who has experience. In general, the ideal treatment would be substitution. So you wanna see how much benzodiazepine that patient's been taking, um, transition them over to a long acting benzodiazepine. You can go ahead and start and lower the dose right then of what they've been taking daily. Um, probably if you're dealing with actual withdrawal symptoms, I would um, do a one-to-one -one and try to keep it about the same and then add a short acting um, benzodiazepine for symptom triggered. Once you have them stabilized, get them through that acute withdrawal, again, ideally you would send them out on a long acting benzodiazepine taper. Ideally that would take weeks to months. So you would really have to have an outpatient provider that's willing to help you with that. And you know the best situation is when it's somebody that the patient has a relationship with, they've been on prescription um, benzodiazepines and they're now gonna be tapered off and they, they can offer them that support as well as monitor it. Um, unfortunately, obviously that's not always the case with our patients. And in that case, it's, it's risky to send them out on a long acting benzodiazepine taper just for concerns of misuse, but um, it, it's probably the safest alternative is to just have that faith in the patient that they will use it correctly. Um, one thing that has been found is that trazodone, um, when used for insomnia related to benzodiazepine withdrawal, is actually really um, effective and also that it can help with keeping people in uh, recovery. CWB is what's used for symptom triggered. It's just your clinical institute withdrawal assessment scale with benzodiazepine. Um, another approach is phenobarbital substitution. Um, this is a great option. A lot of expert opinion recommends phenobarbital as being the smoothest and most effective treatment for sedative hypnotic withdrawal, particularly for patients who cannot complete an outpatient tapering regimen, they're high dose users, they're polysubstance um, dependent, they're experiencing comorbid psychopathology. Um, also, if you're concerned that the benzodiazepine may be reinforcing um, or the withdrawal seems to be resistant to benzodiazepine. So great option. Again, I probably recommend doing the same thing where you convert the daily use of um, benzodiazepine over to phenobarbital and then do a taper. I've actually seen tapers that are set. There's a, load, a set loading dose and then they do a taper over five days, keeping in mind that phenobarbital may have a half-life of up to 100 hours. But again, still a little dicey. I, mean, I definitely have been burned with benzos and have a little bit of, um, of healthy respect and nervousness when it comes to them. Also, some of the literature shows um, using gabapentin, carbamazepine, or valproic acid as a um, adjunctive with phenobarbital. But the bottom line is um, probably a great alternative, may even be better to use than um, transitioning to another benzo because it does have such a long half-life, but probably not a terrible idea to get an addictionologist or someone who has experience involved uh, for the safety of the patient. 
Opioid withdrawals, definitely DSM-5 diagnosable criteria. Again, look for other things that the patient may be taking that can complicate the withdrawal, just as we did with our other ones. Um, usually we think of this as not being life-threatening, but the argument is, is if we have a way to treat withdrawal, it's always important that we go ahead and treat withdrawal symptoms because we know that if we help with the withdrawal, we've just given the patient a nice stepping stone to move forward to recovery. If we're not treating the withdrawal, that puts the patient at a greater risk of going out and grabbing another opioid to try and treat their symptoms. So really um, important to try and do that. Um, again, we do worry about it being life-threatening in people that have serious coronary vascular disease or, or cardiovascular disease. Um, onset and duration is really going to depend on the opioid. It depends on how long they've been taking it, what the dose is, what the duration, what the potency is. Um, for example, heroin withdrawal can start in four to six hours after cessation or reduction, could peak in 36 to 72 and last as long as two weeks. Methadone, it could be 36 hours before you even see any signs of withdrawal and have a very prolonged um, withdrawal phase. Interestingly, tramadol, um, in a clinic I worked in where we were taking patients off of um, chronic pain opioids, um, we would take patients off of tramadol and it's a very protracted withdrawal where the patients will tell you, I just feel like I have a mild flu and it can last weeks. So a lot of variability. Um, an oldie but goodie, clonidine remains a staple in uh, treating alcohol withdrawal, or sorry, opioid withdrawal. It has been proven to shorten detox and to also um, uh, uh, decrease these symptoms that are listed above. We do have to worry about orthostatic hypotension with it. Um, it can be titrated um, up to a max of 1.2 milligrams a day. Have to have careful blood pressure monitoring with that. And if you have been using it consistently at that maximum dose, really good idea to taper it off over several days. Um, a couple others to mention that a lot of you are probably uh, familiar with is the disoplamine for abdominal cramps, bismuth for diarrhea, trazodone or hydroxyzine for insomnia and muscle pain. Interestingly, I was always taught uh, to use cyclobenzaprine, but really the evidence that I've been able to find is more for NSAIDs and acetaminophen being recommended. And I, I probably shouldn't have said evidence, sorry, the recommendations I can find. When it comes to actual evidence, the drug that I was able to find that has the most evidence is trazodone when it comes to this additional symptom control. So, um, so excited to hear that you guys have the Institute of Addiction there. Um, and probably a lot of this is information you already know from having that fabulous resource. But if you have the ability to get a patient connected with a methadone clinic, you can use methadone as a withdrawal agent. And it allows for a very smooth withdrawal because it is so long acting. Um, the challenge is you can't titrate it quickly. Um, so that can make uh, symptoms a little bit challenging to control. But if you have the ability to connect that patient with a methadone clinic, you've talked to the methadone clinic, they're definitely gonna take that patient. You can consider using methadone for their withdrawal. Um, in general, I would encourage you to just have the methadone clinic tell you, or sorry, it's, it's the official term we all say methadone clinic is opioid treatment program. Um, if you have the um, OTP provider available, ask them how they want you to do it. Um, but in general, it's five to 10 milligram doses that are given until symptoms start to improve with a max of 30 to 40 if they're using high dose uh, opioids consistently. You cannot change that for a good three days. Some OTPs will actually tell you not to change it for five days. So you are not gonna be discharging that patient um, with the dose that they're probably gonna be using for opioid use disorder, but hopefully you've at least gotten the, um, the withdrawal under control so that they will remain um, connected with the methadone clinic and continue in recovery and allow them to titrate up. Um, keep in mind that even if you have them connected with the methadone clinic, you absolutely cannot discharge them with a methadone prescription for opioid use disorder. Um, again, keeping in mind that the reason we have to take a long time for doing this titration is because of the long half-life. It's also um, a little variable and they're not great conversions when we look at how much opioid a patient's been using to be able to convert that to methadone. So we really have to worry about respiratory depression. And of course, we always worry about PT prolongation. Buprenorphine, yay, the X waiver is gone. So 
this is a great alternative for you to use for alcohol withdrawal. I mean, sorry, I keep saying alcohol withdrawal. APA withdrawal, fantastic idea, especially if the patient's already in withdrawal. Um, so as you all probably know, um, you cannot start it when the patient is already on another opioid, or you should not start it when a patient's on another opioid because it can precipitate withdrawal. And a lot of the patients will tell you it's a more abrupt and a more severe withdrawal when they're already kind of starting to go through their withdrawal um, with another substance and we throw buprenorphine on. However, in theory, you should be able to just titrate up the buprenorphine and it will stop that withdrawal. Currently, it's still recommended to start it while they're in withdrawal. Um, that means no long acting for about 36 hours, no short acting for about 12 to 24 hours. That obviously would include heroin. Um, you can use the clinical opioid withdrawal syndrome um, or scale to be able to determine um, if they're actually actively in withdrawal, and that can also help you with your symptom triggered. I think we're going to see some big changes in the literature coming up because with the X waiver going away, I think we're going to get rid of this demystification of buprenorphine and being worried about using larger doses, et cetera. Right now, the recommendations is to start two to four milligrams and titrate it in two to four milligram doses. A lot of literature is going to tell you max dose of eight in the first day. Um, some will go up to 16 milligrams. Realistically, I start with four milligrams. I titrate with four milligrams. You can go up to 24 milligrams a day. That is probably safe. Some patients that are in opioid use disorder treatment require that. Um, and buprenorphine is just really a very safe drug. Um, in general, though, I find that I don't have to go up that high. But you could always potentially um, go up that high if absolutely necessary, and then you can titrate them down um, as their symptoms are under better control. Remember, um, at least in my institution, I presume it might be the same for yours, for cost benefits, we use straight buprenorphine here in the hospital sublingually but um, you want to discharge them if they've got opioid use disorder on buprenorphine naloxone, so on the combination drug. As of right now, you should be able to do that even if you don't have an X waiver. Ideally, you would be discharging them straight to someone who's willing to treat their opioid use disorder and continue the buprenorphine naloxone. If they're not, um, I recommend doing a taper and just have that taper be three to four weeks. Again, um, trying to make sure that you're um, controlling any potential symptoms for withdrawal or, or protracted withdrawal, and that you're also um, kind of giving them that step to hopefully stay in recovery. This is the opioid withdrawal scale. Um, a question I get quite oftentimes is if the patient's on chronic buprenorphine or methadone for opioid use disorder, can you continue it in the hospital setting since um, you are not? federally licensed? The answer is absolutely. Just call the um, opioid treatment program and ask them what the dose is to confirm it. If there's a medical issue that's affecting the dose and you're worried about um, not clearing it well, um, obviously you can dose reduce them. And if you have access to their OTP, it's great to talk with them about it. Um, buprenorphine, it's not going to be a problem because the X waiver is gone, but obviously you do um, continue it. Uh, be aware, at least if your system is like our system for the OTPs, if they're giving buprenorphine in an OTP or methadone in an OTP, it is not um, in our prescription drug monitoring program. So if that's the case, um, your patient may report they're on buprenorphine, but you're not seeing it on the prescription drug monitoring program. Is it something that's actually reported um, by that group? Um, another issue that comes up quite oftentimes, and I am um, still get called by my own group um, several times who I have talked to about this a lot, but the bottom line is if they're on chronic buprenorphine or methadone for opioid use disorder and they're in the hospital um, and they've got acute pain, what do you do? A lot of the old teaching was to take patients off of buprenorphine, for example, prior to a surgery or something of that nature to try and titrate them off so that you could use other opioids. The um, recommendations now are just to go ahead and continue it um, and not to try and titrate them off of their medications. Um, what you need to do is just focus on multimodal, as we should with all of our patients, um, using non-pharmacologics, of course, maximizing the use of non-opioids for pain. But let's be honest here, um, these patients, um, you know, their perception of pain tends to be um, higher than individuals that are not exposed to opioids. So they're probably gonna need an opioid um, and they're gonna need that opioid at a much higher dose than usual because you've got that competition at the mu receptor. So just be aware, 
um, the patient's not trying to be manipulative in any way, they are going to need a much higher dose than someone else who is not on the chronic buprenorphine or methadone. And they're going to need it frequently, and they're probably going to need it scheduled. So um, kind of frequent and fixed is what it's called. So just be aware for that um, with that patient population. So now I'm going to transition. Oh, it's so late. Um, gosh, guys, I didn't realize it was this late. Uh, Manira, do you want me to try and keep going? It looks like I've only got four minutes. Yeah, I, I maybe we'll stop here if that's okay with you, Dr. Holmes Maybank, and we'll see if anyone has any questions because um, it is 1256. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I practiced this and I had this so much faster. <laughs> it's totally, totally, seven. totally okay. I mean, um, what we heard was wonderful. So um, if okay with everyone, maybe we'll stop here so we can have uh, at least time for one to two questions, if that's okay with you, Dr. Holmes, uh, maybe. Of course. Okay. Do I, look, do I look in the chat or what do I do for that? I will just open it up for you if that's okay. And um, okay. whoever has a question or comment um, can unmute themselves or put comments in the chat. That is also totally okay. But I want to start off by by saying, even though you did not get to finish your talk, um, thank you for, for the amazing talk, um, something I think that's relevant to all of us. Um, as you mentioned, we do have a wonderful addiction service uh, here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, but I think such an important part for all of us internal medicine phys physicians to be able to be comfortable with as well. And I can personally say as someone who just finished residency, this is a very uncomfortable area for me. So uh, I appreciate the talk so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmes. Oh, you're very welcome. As you can tell, I can talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. I think we could take one question or comment and then we'll have to um, pop off. Hi, this is Jessica Sarmiento. I'm one of the hospitalists here. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the talk. I did have a question about gabapentin. So when we're giving it for patients in alcohol withdrawal, is there a specific uh, recommendation of how fast we can up titrate to the 1800 daily? Yes. So excellent question. Um, and this was new to me when I first started using it. You actually go ahead and start right there. It's the opposite of pain. Um, you go ahead and you start it at that high dose. And you actually, um, if you're having to send the patient out on a taper, I would tell you to taper down um, by 100 milligrams for each dose um, each week. So, you know, for example, here, we quite often do 400 TID, then we do 300 TID for, we keep it on until the patient leaves, and then we do 400 for a week, 300 for a week, um, TID, obviously 200, 100. So we taper it down. Um, you know, again, the evidence is, uh, what evidence there is, is uh, for 1800 a day, which I don't think I have an issue with and in talking to my pharmacist would be fine. Culturally here, we've always done um, 300 to 400 three times a day. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sarmiento. I think we may have a quick question or comment. Um, time for one quick question or comment, because I know it's 12.59. I would just um, like to jump in then and say thank you. And I think that um, <clears throat> while you reference our Addiction um, Medicine Institute, which is outstanding, I think this is very helpful for us to understand what goes on outside of a center like Beth Israel with a very high volume around this. And that, you, you know, as we all move through our careers, we need to take on different hats sometimes than those expected. And um, delve into areas and create top level services and treatment programs, even if all the resources we're used to having available aren't there. So mm -hmm. I think this was really eye-opening for uh, many of us who got, have gotten very used to what we do here locally to hear some outside perspectives. So thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. And actually, um, if it's possible, because I didn't get to, into my, what I'm super excited about right now, which is trying to encourage people to um, consider initiating treatment before discharge for use disorder. Obviously we talk about it a lot with opioid use disorder, but um, there's actually more information emerging out there for alcohol use disorder. Um, I do have the slides that pertain to that, that 
you're welcome to share with everybody. And I even have like a full script written out. <laughs> um, so if that's something anybody's interested in, I'm more than happy to share it because I think that's going to be something that hopefully will, will be part of the future of our treatment. We'll be trying to initiate not only for opioid use disorder, but also for alcohol use disorder in the future. That would be wonderful. And I would be happy to distribute it to our faculty and residents. So thank you so much. I'll close off with that. Once again, a huge thank you, Dr. Holmes Maybank for this wonderful, wonderful lecture. It was a pleasure having you here and we'd love to have you back in the future. Thank you so thank much. You. I promise not to talk so much about phenobarbital <laughs> next time. It was great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> pleasure seeing everyone today. Thank you so much and have uh, a great rest of your day. Bye, well, thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, yeah, um, we'll have to, we'll debrief on this because I did, certainly did not expect to spend all this time on it. And I wanted to talk about the X waiver, all that stuff. So you can tell me kind of where I need to shore it up. Sure. I've got to run to uh, our recruitment. I'll catch you on the next call. All right. Take care. All right. Unless Thank that's you. today, in which case, tell everyone I'm not there because of recruitment. <laughs> Will do if I make it too. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.